Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Docker webinar. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation audio using your company speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our speaker today. Just type your questions into the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email to view the recording. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Max Roddy, Lead Analytics Software Developer at Boston Consultant Group. I will now turn things over to you, Max. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Molly. Okay. Uh, so for the purpose of this demonstration, I think um, everyone is aware of the topic. So why don't we just start with a, uh, I know this very classic BCG, we'll start with a uh, deck kind of explaining uh, the narrative that we'll have for this presentation. Uh, from there, we'll go on to a live demo. Uh, hopefully everything will work as intended. And then uh, during that time, uh, we are open to questions and then a Q and A session, um, and feel free to ask those questions um, as the presentation goes on. So, first off, uh, let's let me start with who am I? I am a lead analytics developer at BCG Gamma X. I am a part-time PhD student at King's College London, uh, focusing on rendering uh, algorithms uh, for rendering engines and uh, with a special focus on optics, specifically uh, classical as well as uh, quantum optics, uh, which has led to a provisional patent uh, within the blockchain sector. Previously, I worked at Citibank uh, for a number of aspects and wore a number of different hats around really DevOps, uh, software engineering, and project management. And after that, I moved on to a small startup called Automation Logic in London, uh, which uh, I only stayed there for about six months. After that, I moved on to BCG Digital Ventures in November, or sorry, in June of 2016, and I stayed there until November of 2017. And uh, I then transitioned into BCG Gamma, as I, I believe the second Gamma X hire after Andrea. Uh, I still need to check that. I, I keep saying I'll check that, but I, have, I haven't had the chance to. And um, since then, I've been here as a lead engineer for, back engineer for source, and we're gonna come to the source point uh, shortly. So before we go on, uh, let's maybe kind of discuss what uh, BCG Gamma and Gamma X do. Uh, Gamma is the advanced analytics and data science branch of uh, BCG with a focus on uh, statistics, data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. They are uh, very much the data science element of this group, and they are the ones developing the models, uh, as well as the items that we produce during the proof of concept phase, we'll say. With GAMAX, we tend to be more focused on turning those models into a production-ready element. Uh, so we will take those BCG GAMMA models, we will uh, apply some elements of engineering to take them into a state whereby they are maintainable over time, uh, they are reproducible, and they are not necessarily just in an R&D or PFC phase, but they can actually be introduced to the wild uh, and handle themselves appropriately. So, with that said, uh, what is source? Why have you built it? What, where does Docker Enterprise fit into all this? Uh, essentially, what it comes down to is that we know that data scientists tend to not be engineers and we don't really expect them to be either. We've noticed a gap in the market within our capacity to make a, sorry, minimize this, a, to make a streamlined proof of concept to a production ready model transition happens seamlessly and especially painlessly. Uh, there's usually quite a lot of time spent trying to go from that R and D phase to something that can be truly in a production ready environment for our corporate clients. Uh, and furthermore, we want to ensure that our client data is secure 
and there can be zero chance of cross-pollination between cases, uh, and that refers to both, well, a number of aspects, the data, the models, the infrastructure itself, uh, credentials, workspaces as far as exploration spaces, and uh, the IDEs themselves. And that essentially leads to, uh, you know, these seven principles, which are that you could run your model on any kind of infrastructure, which is kind of the key point of Docker. It's essentially one of the key features that we have with Docker. Uh, we need to provide clients access to analytics output on demand. We need to additionally be able to test our models against production grade standards. We need to deploy them as lightweight web services to uh, our customers. And we need to make sure that the data and the models themselves uh, are secure. And on top of that, we need to share the model of code and output uh, across uh, the client or across within various case team members. And how we deal with that is quite important. And for most of these things, in fact, for about four of those points, uh, Docker is a crucial piece in that uh, ecosystem. So let's quickly discuss uh, where we were before and where we are now and what exactly is that we've done with this solution that we're going to showcase here. Uh, essentially, when we, when we first wanted to introduce Docker Enterprise into the source ecosystem, which was essentially at uh, day one, we noticed that there wasn't really a lot of playbooks or automation around this. Uh, what we were referred to involved uh, some use of Terraform, but it essentially required that the, that you have static IPs, you SSH back and forth between uh, the master to get your manager and worker tokens, uh, which we didn't feel was you know, a, a secure method and it certainly didn't fit the source philosophy of removing uh, these credentials and whatnot. Um, and it certainly wasn't turnkey um, in the sense that you had to have a lot of manual steps. Uh, and with, the, with this diagram, I can, uh, Share that as well. We have a legend as to what the steps were that were actually involved to do the left hand side as well as the right hand side. Um, and essentially, even after you did all of this, you had to deal with insecure redirects even after you bootstrapped the uh, environment, which again wasn't ideal. Um, and finally, we couldn't really use auto scaling groups because there was no mechanism for dealing with the race conditions for both the managers and the replicas. Uh, so with that, we end up developing a uh, solution that we feel is uh, pretty well uh, hardened and it works uh, for our use case. Um, not to say that it doesn't have room for improvement, and we will discuss that as well, but we do uh, feel that we've addressed uh, all of the items that you see here. We have a bootstrap mechanism that's nearly turnkey. We've developed a Go DTR, Go-based DTR client uh, that essentially allows us to interact between uh, DTR uh, as well as the calling functions, and we can then synchronize things like GitHub Enterprise and uh, Docker Trusted Registry and any other elements that would be involved in making a conceptual notion of what a organization or case would be for BCG Gamma and Gamma X, uh, as well as any other decisions within BCG, BCG that would require that usefulness for data science and machine learning. So with that, we, we did deal again with also the uh, association element. We removed that by using Vault from HashiCorp. Uh, the bootstrap is entirely, almost entirely done by Terraform from HashiCorp. Uh, there's no secure redirects uh, simply because we now use the auth API calls to get things like the cert bundles, uh, which are part of the Docker suite. And we additionally also uh, do some elements uh, with dealing with the race conditions, which we ourselves developed uh, through some um, interesting logic, which we'll showcase shortly. Okay, so with that, let's maybe jump back. And uh, what we're going to do is demonstrate a bootstrap scenario of the environment. Um, and while that's going on, uh, we'll leave it open to Q&A so that if any just want to raise questions or um, you know, address anything that we've discussed so far. They, uh, they're they more than welcome to. So, 
and their questions uh, so far with the presentation and what we're showcasing. No, currently there's no questions. I just reminded folks, so if you do have any questions for Max, please drop those into the questions pane and we'll get those answered. Okay, fantastic. Um, if not, I think uh, what we can then showcase while Terraform is doing its elements in the background, uh, we'll showcase uh, some of the code base that we've developed for this and really where the bulk of the magic, I would say, comes in. Um, so within this, we have set a number of elements which uh, help to create this, uh, this dynamic and self-healing capacity that uh, we've talked about. Uh, the first is that we have two AMIs uh, that we use, which are pulled as they're paid by Packer, and uh, those themselves are encrypted, and we have them kind of put down here, which will create Docker-based image that uh, we use for any of the uh, instances that require Docker, which is pretty much everything. Um, the ones that we'll specifically use for DTR, and the ones that we'll specifically use for the UCP manager. Uh, these were these are encrypted as well, uh, so they are quite secure in their production. Uh, Jake Burkowski from Ernest Cloud was uh, the one to develop that for us, um, and we'll come to a major contributor section shortly. Uh, but this allows us to then update our AMIs independently, and then once they're updated, we can recycle the instances as needed, and they'll be pulled. From there, we have a series of, um, well, we have a replication in two states. One is the UCP managers. We have a template file that will grab all the relevant information and it will render it appropriately within uh, this user data that is run at uh, start time, uh, which we'll come to shortly. Uh, we have the launch configurations and the auto scaling groups that go with that for the UCP managers. And likewise, we have a similar philosophy for TR. So it looks almost identical in nature, it conceptually, uh, we treat them the same aside from the variables that need to be set, uh, which are specific to one type of uh, cluster relative to the other. But it keeps it fairly clean and simplistic. Uh, if you see here, we have, for this instance, we've run it quite, uh, this demo environment quite small, but we normally use private Terraform enterprise for the backend. In this case, we're using simply buckets. And the one important thing that I wanted to show is that, for example, here, um, even for the credentials uh, that get used, they are done by an encrypted method. So even when we showcase the elements that will show in the user data uh, shortly, uh, and when we are applying the bootstrap mechanism, uh, which I'll showcase, which will create the rollback-based uh, organizations uh, and machine users that we use within Docker uh, and Docker registry, uh, that is done in a secure fashion as well. And we have an additional webinar whereby we discuss the security elements um, in the future. But if we go through that while this is uh, leading up, what we'll quickly go through is the DTR. Uh, actually, let's start with the manager logic. So we have a the user data, which uh, is a template file, which will have the variables that we showcase here uh, dynamically rendered into them, and they will come from a number of locations, one of them being the main file, as well as grabbing elements that are required from the remote VPC module that we use. But if we go back here, we'll see uh, a number of key features. The first is that we have the ability to write and read secrets to Vault. Uh, there are two vaults that we use. One is a shared vault, and the other is a an environment-specific vault. Uh, so things that the shared vault would maintain would be the license that we use for Docker Enterprise, um, and the things that we would use in the environment-specific Docker Trusted Registry would be things like the uh, potentially the root tokens uh, that are required for accessing certain things or perhaps the manager token or worker token uh, that are specific to this uh, environment, so whether it be dev, staging, or production. We have the uh, AMIs baked with the UCP 
tar of choice that we will use, and the Packer build will grab that relevant tar for the version that we want. Uh, it's ambiguous here, the naming convention that it can determine the version that we want to use. And then we will load that uh, configuration for UCP so that we can then instantiate the UCP managers and determine which one will be mastered. So for that, this is where we come to the logic whereby we have to deal with race conditions. Um, and that's where things get a little interesting. Uh, because we are dealing with distributed systems that have their own internal leader election mechanism, they have their own uh, certificates uh, system that they use to manage secure communication and whatnot, uh, we have to have this um, interesting philosophy of, well, how do we determine which one should be the master? Uh, you have three instances that come up. So as a backtrack, we have three instances for UCP and we have three instances for DTR. Uh, this is the recommended setting by which Docker advise us. Advise us. And within that context, uh, we had to figure out since the, anything that comes up in an auto scaling group, uh, they come up at the same time. So you have three instances that come up at the same time. They're all going to be trying to instantiate themselves as some sort of UCP manager. Uh, so one of them has to be you know, explicitly told that it needs to be the master. So the, uh, we, we approach this in a simplistic way, which was that simply we look at if it's subnet A and that we can't ping UCP, uh, the UCP endpoint and get an okay response, then what's happened is that uh, we are bootstrapping the environment. So therefore, this is gonna be the UCP master. It will generate uh, the passwords appropriately. They'll be handoff. These secrets will be written to our vault uh, to be used later. And if otherwise, it's gonna join as a manager. Uh, that makes it quite simple. Um, and if you know a new master has been elected, it doesn't change anything. The credentials to log in will be identical. Uh, the one thing that will change is the UCP IP, which is associated with the master. Um, and that's something that we need to be mindful of. And firstly, uh, for DTR, uh, there's a bit more interesting logic. Uh, we still have the same uh, functions as far as you know, read and write. Uh, we also have the capacity by which we need to grab tokens from vaults so that we can join as worker. And the abstraction is still the same for the version and the loading of the uh, Docker elements that we need to use for DTR. So again, the tar for the DTR version that we want to use is baked in uh, and it will be loaded and then removed. We will check a number of elements as far as checking over DNS record for the UCP manager uh, sorry, master has come up. Um, we will then attempt to grab the certificates appropriately uh, from that instance and do it via an authoriz authorization token. So we see here that we're grabbing the bundle uh, via an auth token. We're using the UCP admin password, which has been grabbed from Vault, uh, and then doing a secure login to that uh, instance or a group of instances for UCP. In this specific element for using uh, the specific UCP IP, but we will transition away from that once we have a service-oriented architecture for dealing exactly with this kind of scenario via console. And then what needs to happen is we do um, something similar. We have to check if a DTR node should be a master or is it a replica. And within that context, again, we use the same logic. The only difference is we're not checking the DTR endpoint and we're checking that it's healthy. And if so, you know, if these conditions, uh, if it's subnet A, DTR healthy is not true, and therefore we'll join as a master. And from there, we can do a number of things. First is that we need to initialize storage. Uh, we need to disable single sign-on because this causes the insecure redirect, and we'll come back to that point there. And then finally, uh, we have to deal with the logic of what happens when we're dealing with replicas and what happens if a replica stays unhealthy. Um, and this is where we uh, dealt with a few issues. So this actually came up today that we had to apply a hotfix for this. So uh, during this demo, we'll showcase this and uh, we, we hope that will work uh, as intended. Uh, 
If not, we'll post up another video which will showcase exactly what happens uh, from beginning to end with a bootstrap uh, so that uh, the viewers don't feel that they've been kind of chipped out on this. Uh, now that said, uh, this essentially runs everything. In this case, we're removing unhealthy uh, containers or replicas, if you will. And in this element for uh, replica, we'll say one, this is replica two. And otherwise, we then join afterwards. So this forces a kind of sanity check to make sure that there's a healthy number of healthy environments uh, running. Now, that said, uh, we should be able to now hit this. And leave this. Yep. And what I will do is so this is a shared file that we have for this. Uh, I have my. Bear with me one sec. And we can see here that we have a number of nodes. We have three managers and the workers, um, which means that DTR should be accessible as well. Um, and if we apply uh, smart password. Okay. Uh, the license uh, element, I ignore for a moment. We're, uh, that's simply because we're not linking to our shared uh, Vault instance, which would have, as I mentioned before, the licenses that we use and whatnot. Uh, so these, uh, this error would normally not happen. And what we should be seeing is elements whereby the workers, yeah, the rest of the workers are joining. So you can see that another worker is coming up, um, although it's that's a a health check. Uh, and as they come up, we'll see these DTRs come up. Um, and we will have the three UCP managers, uh, one of them being master, and the three DTRs, one of them being a master, if you will, and two replicas, uh, which will act as the standby for them. Um, and that will address the whole element of bringing this architecture up. Uh, while we wait for the DTR instances to come up, uh, are there any questions or items that anyone wants to address? Matt, currently we don't have any questions, but um, for those who are on or in the yeah. event, please submit any questions that you may have in the questions panel. We can ask them over to Matt. Okay, no problem. Um, so with that in mind, let's maybe perhaps take a look inside uh, what's happening within these instances. So we can see that worker 248 and 121. So let's maybe do this and so once you want C and so the one from B has not joined yet and we can see that it's still initializing. Um, so let's maybe just talk into that. So do this. I should see. Okay, so we can see that it's attempting to join. Uh, we can see here that the certs were downloaded, so it's already passed uh, the step of grabbing the bundle, which should be here. And it's, oh, it's um, unzipped it to a directory, which is the home certs directory that we have here. So, that said, um, once this joins, we'll then go on to, uh, you know, bootstrap the, the environment. So we'll run the bootstrap, which will create the machine users and whatnot. In fact, we may actually be able to do that now. Uh, so this should be able to do it. What I will need to do is change this vault token. 
Uh, and I'm just doing this as a demo purpose. In reality, the elements would all be managed via a shared uh, secrets management system. So this wouldn't be done by someone's command line terminal to do this. We're just replicating it uh, to showcase this capacity. So what I will do is And this should create all the elements that we need for this. And we can see here that it's creating the repositories, the machine users, it's adding role based access to some of them, it's then adding these passwords to Vault and saving them there so they're not actually within. Um, our space and on our, our environment. We don't have this intermediary exposure. Um, and one of the other cool elements that we wanted to showcase as well is if we go here, um, even say for the managers, we don't showcase the uh, information within the user data. So you can see here, it's using the encrypted uh, credentials that we passed. Um, so there's nothing that anyone can use. Uh, we don't have any paths even exposed for fault. Uh, if we go downward, passwords are still not exposed. The credentials for the user login are not exposed. The tokens themselves are not exposed. Um, the vault token itself is not exposed. So it's fairly uh, secure in that sense and uh, allows us quite, quite a large room for flexibility in these builds. So let's go back and check that we have our organizations. We have our organizations. We have everything that we wanted. Um, you know, we have users that were added and these organizations you can see who can do what within this and the teams that are associated with it. So um, if there's still no further questions, what we'll do is we'll uh, take down one of the DTR instances, just showcase that which should come up correctly, um, especially with the hotfix that we've applied, uh, if that uh, is okay with everyone. Take silence. And this scenario means that there are no questions around this. Okay. In which case, uh, we'll take DTR E down. Let's see the recovery mechanisms in action. Okay. And it will take a little bit of time. So while that's coming up, I'll jump back to the side uh, and show this where, where there are areas of improvement. One issue that we see is that uh, the cert bundles don't always download, and we're working with Docker to resolve this. Uh, we still have a single point of failure when DTR connects to UCP, because if it doesn't connect appropriately, uh, something's going to be wonky. So we, we still need to have some better health checking system around this. Uh, we rarely run into it, but it's still something that we would like to resolve. We can truly say that everything is self-healing if it doesn't self-heal even on the edge cases. So that's what we're working to address now. How to back uh, up without taking uh, UCP down. Uh, this is something that we actually haven't come up with a viable solution for. We're still ideating around this, uh, but when it does go, when UCP does go down for the backup element, it's only down for a few seconds um, and impacts a very small user base uh, in this regard. Uh, and the final element is performing blue-green deployments given the IP constraint uh, that we've seen with Docker, which is that uh, they ex we expect that the master IP is always the same, um, and that's obviously not always true. Uh, so we have a blue-green deployment in PR now. Uh, we have done it 
the issue is that it's uh, destructive on the first pass, and then after that, every other pass is uh, non-destructive. Uh, but until we have the service-oriented architecture by a council, which uh, will do the dynamic uh, IP um, finding, essentially, we held off on performing that blue-green deployment update to the relevant environments. The challenges that we've had with you know, the Docker Enterprise Suite, um, the, the side name is a bit uh, misleading, it's not with Docker, but uh, with the Docker Enterprise Suite itself, is as we mentioned, the CERT bundles don't always download. Uh, we also have an element whereby user data needs to check if it's master or not, and again, DTR, the DTR health check is unreliable, so one thing we haven't showcased here, uh, we do have to check but we showcase that we have to check the DTR mass, which one is the DTR mass and which one is the replica or which ones are the replicas. Uh, the element that we haven't showcased is that actually uh, the API call for the health check uh, on DTR will say that the replicas are okay, even if an underlying mechanism is not okay. So one of the things that we see is that briefing DB uh, may not be behaving gracefully or functioning properly and we end up with a scenario whereby we've had to add uh, this health check, which essentially, if coming back, <clears throat> apologies, if coming back into a subnet uh, that previously was occupied, uh, then you know, essentially flush um, the replica associated with that, do a remove on that replica uh, that was within that subnet uh, previously, and then register a new replica. Uh, we have a single point failure again, which we mentioned when these are connected to UCP, so some of these are quite uh, similar. And the final one is that API calls uh, we needed were uh, undocumented. That's not to say that the functionality wasn't there. It absolutely was there. The element was that we had to kind of probe around and dig around within the internal mechanisms uh, of what we saw, and we've given that feedback back to Docker. Um, we're happy, again, to assist within that element. As, as we find more things, um, we're happy to give that feedback back. And then the, uh, the, what we feel are the accomplishments. Um, first one being the reverse engineering of the web API for undocumented calls. Uh, the second item being that, as we've showcased, there's no element in the user data that exposes um, yeah. any element uh, to someone who may be able to get access to the AWS console. So even if they do get access to that, they don't necessarily have keys to the kingdom uh, within the Docker ecosystem. Uh, and that we do a check on uh, DTR because if they exist there or not. Um, and finally, we've overcome the recycle issue with Docker bootstraps. So one of the issues that we saw was that when we first would launch things like DTR, they would kind of, you would have these three DTR instances that were in a zombie state, and they were not um, doing any sort of sanity check or gracefulness on themselves. So we had a mechanism by which uh, eventually they would sing themselves back up and act appropriately within that uh, environment. So before I go on to the major contributors, uh, just like to showcase, but ideally, all of this has worked as intended. And what we'll do is okay. ah, unfortunately. So, and this one. Um, this is exactly the item that we're trying to solve today by Hotfix. So what we'll do is we'll create a follow-up video on this. Um, this is an issue that only came up as of today. We actually had tested all of this up until this morning, and then we've, we've encountered this for the first time. Uh, but essentially, this is why we've added this Docker remove element, uh, which I'm guessing is having some issue with the parsing of the parameters that I've given it. Uh, but this is something that we'll address and we'll showcase uh, in a follow-up video so that uh, we can showcase that this is truly um, self-healing and does administer itself well and is a uh, true near, you know, near 
a turnkey solution uh, to the Docker Enterprise Suite. Okay, any questions so far before I go on? No, no Mac, we are good. Yeah. Okay. In that case, then, I'll go on to the major contributors. Um, this was uh, for, essentially done by uh, quite a few people within the source uh, product team. And within that, I would say the major contributors to the build that you've seen now uh, are myself, uh, Jake Burkowski, who is a um, employee for Runners Cloud, which is our AWS uh, consultant. Uh, they have given us a, a tremendous amount of help over a number of things from uh, being a good soundboard where Jake, Nate, and I have sat in a room in New York for several hours figuring out how we're going to do all the security handoff and transition and ensure that everything is locked down as much as possible so that we don't have any corporate client data leaked or that the architecture is vulnerable in some way and we pass our penetration testing uh, very much via their help. Uh, Nate Amos Smith, who is the uh, owner and founder of Run As Cloud, uh, who again, helped us tremendously in identifying where security vulnerabilities could be, what's the best way to proceed in certain elements, um, and helping with the overall architecting of the certain components in the source ecosystem. Bart, uh, who is a recent joiner to Gamma X, but he's been a contractor before that uh, with us, um, and he's the one who actually created the Go DTR client. So if I were to say uh, the overall two major contributors that carried everything to the final stretch that got us to do a lot of these things, uh, Jake and Bart, uh, the work they do is incredibly tremendous. Uh, they, the synergy that they have as far as doing all of these things is phenomenal, uh, not just from you know Jake doing the vault integration and sync up and removing the user data piece, uh, whereby there's no data exposure that way, uh, but Bart's go DTR client and uh, what we saw, the source CTL, which will bootstrap uh, Docker, which relies on the go DTR client that he made as well. Um, both of those pieces of work were um, by far one of the biggest contributions to uh, that element of the product and the Docker enterprise ecosystem that we've seen. And that, and uh, I'll hand it over to the Docker folks to do their closing bit, unless there are any questions. If there's any additional questions, please put them in the question box. Max, I think you answered everything for everyone. It doesn't seem to be that we have any questions today. <laughs> good, good. Great. Well, Max, thank you for taking the time to present today. Um, this is Trisha from Docker. I just wanted for anyone to you know, get some more information about what Max talked about today and about Docker Enterprise. You can always go to docker.com. We actually just rebranded and relaunched our new website. Uh, so check out docker.com backslash product backslash Docker Enterprise. And uh, you can try it out for yourself. Um, so we have a free Docker Enterprise trial. It's a hosted trial, so no installation required for you to get comfortable and familiar with Docker Enterprise. Um, Max, thanks again for taking the time out. We sure. will have this webinar um, available at the conclusion of today's event within the next 24 hours, so we'll be able to share the recording with everyone um, who's able to attend or not attend. And I just wanted to thank all the attendees for uh, joining us today. And Max, how does how can if uh, any of the attendees wanted to reach out to you directly, how can they reach you? That's a very good point. Uh, so feel free to reach me at my uh, BCG email, which is roddy.max at bcg.com. Um, and I'll give the information. Well, Trisha already obviously has it, uh, but I'll make sure that we propagate the information outwards as well. Um, and we can, we're more than happy to help and answer questions. For the number of elements that we've seen from the security pieces to, you know, infrastructure as code to a number of other elements uh, as well. Great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending. Melanie, I'm not sure if you had any closing comments. 
Nope, I was just going to, you covered it. I was just going to remind that, you know, to everyone that today's session was recorded. And as Tricia said, you'll receive a follow-up email to view the recording within 24 hours. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.